I've been living in the streets for a couple weeks now. Having recently turned 18, my parents decided to surprise me with the boot out the door. I think they were planning this since they found out that I was gay a couple of months ago. My fault for being stupid enough to not get a job and save up beforehand. I cared too much about my academics and focused most of my time on studying. I guess that didn't exactly pan out. My birthday was the day after graduation. I begged and pleaded and even offered to go to conversion therapy, but they didn't budge. I came back home to the locks changed and my stuff packed in a suitcase. I had to unenroll from the university I was accepted to because I could no longer afford it. Even with loans and my scholarships, I couldn't afford the rooming fees and my parents would no longer help me out with filling out anything. I also lost all my friends when they found out about my sexuality, so I couldn't find a couch to crash on. Regardless, I had some money saved up from birthdays and holidays, but that was quickly used up at motel stays. The towns around me were full of dying businesses and declining populations, so I decided to use the last of my money and go to a nearby city. I won't go into details as to the exact location out of safety concerns. I guess it doesn't matter because what's happening here is probably happening everywhere else. The first day I arrived, I tried to look for jobs, but who wants to hire a disheveled teenager? I didn't have anything nice to wear for interviews. And besides, the cost of transportation and even hygiene upkeep was hard to maintain. Essentially, I was screwed for the time being. Homeless shelters were all closed. Are they only prioritized women? I soon found myself in a homeless encampment. I couldn't sleep anywhere else. The parks had security roaming and everywhere else. I would find myself being the victim of attacks or even people throwing crap at me for entertainment. I had enough pride not to beg though. I was sure that I could find something soon. I'm not sure how people wound up here, but it was a small makeshift settlement under a highway. Tall rusted steel held up the highway, looming over our tents and garbage that we held on to as mementos as people whizzed by going off into their perfect little lives. It felt like we were stuck in a bubble. As time went on and people advanced, we just stood still, stuck in this dreadful purgatory. There were even fences around the area, covered with blue tarp, hiding away our shame from the rest of the city. I was still luckier than most of the people around me though. I still had all my senses and didn't have any chronic conditions, nor any drug addictions. Life hadn't beaten me down that path yet. The first night I spent in this area, I was getting ready to settle in for the night, pulling myself up on one of the bridge bases in the center of the encampment, when I heard rustling from all around me. It was as if everyone had the sudden idea of hiding in their tents. I looked around me, all alarmed. Could it be the cops? Naked, you got somewhere to stay. I heard a man's rough voice ask before coughing violently. I'm sorry, I replied. Do you need a tent to stay in? I got extra room in here if you want. He replied while gesturing at his small, dirty tent. It looked like it could barely hold one person, let alone two. I think I'm... Nathan, the boy is fine. A bundled up woman with dirt streaks on her face appeared out of nowhere, pushing me away from him. Hun, you shouldn't be here. Are you sure you have nowhere else to go? She whispered. No, why? What's going on? I asked, quite alarmed. She shifted her gaze and pushed me towards her tent. It was much larger than Nathan's. Its bright yellow plastic covering which had seen better days was now held together by duct tape. Listen, kid, there's a couple rules that you have to follow. You can stay here, but you need to know them by heart. Follow? She asked in a hurried tone. I merely nodded as I looked around. The tent had a small cot, an oil lamp, and there was a pile of clothing in the corner next to a shopping cart. It might not have been much, but it was way better than being out on the streets empty-handed. Rule 1. They only come out when the sun sets. 
and they go back into hiding when dawn breaks. Her worried tone was getting a bit harsh. Nothing made sense. Who was them? I tried to ask who they were, but I could tell she wouldn't answer until she had finished. Roll two. Do not let them know of your presence. You're done if you do. And last rule. Whatever you hear or see, do not go out. Even if it's your friend or family member's voices screaming for help. Do you understand me? She said, trying to put up a brave front. But I could tell she was scared as she could ever be. Okay, I got the rules, but who are they? I asked, trying to get something out of her. Being kept in the dark about anything like this just wouldn't put my mind at ease. We can talk about it tomorrow, but tonight you need to rest. In a couple of hours, it'll be midnight and we should both be asleep by then. She hastily said while putting on a bunch of blankets on a sleeping bag. I gently smiled and began to make my way into the sleeping bag. As much as I wanted answers, I was exhausted from the entire day. I knew that I had to keep my guard up in case she wanted to hurt me but somehow her presence made me feel safe. She seemed so genuine, friendly, and warm. All qualities that I never saw in my own mother. I closed my eyes for a second and before I knew it, I was in the depths of the dark abyss known as sleep. I'm not sure what time it was when the barking and cries of dogs startled me awake. I laid in the sleeping bag trying to make sense of my surroundings. The inside of the tent was dark, um, but because of the flimsy plastic, I could see the silhouette of objects outside. The streetlights casted an eerie glow onto everything. I could feel it before I heard or even saw it. I'm not even sure how, but I felt my fight or flight reaction kick in. Every hair in my body rose and I could feel this tension in the air, like lightning before it struck. The air turned to putrid with the smell of decay and whines of all the animals got louder. I wanted to close my eyes, but I couldn't help but look to see what it was. I looked over to my right and saw the silhouette of a hunched over person. There was something extremely wrong about it though. Its arms were down to its feet, and I could see the protruding bones of its back. It had long messy hair and a large dog-like snout for a nose. I thought maybe the distance was distorting its shadow, but something about it was so unnerving, I wanted to close my eyes and go back home. It wandered away for a short while, but my fear still lingered throughout the night. I didn't sleep a bit, and I waited until the woman got up. Morning, kid, she said with a smile while getting up. I never got your name, I said while looking down at the floor. The name's Sandra. What's yours? Matthew, I whispered. I saw something last night. She got silent and made a serious face. She started getting off the cot and made her way to a table, grabbing a water bottle for me before taking one for herself. What did this one look like? She took a sip before asking. What do you mean this one? Are there more? I'm gonna be honest, kid. I don't know what they are. They started coming out of the sewers a couple months back. Right after the forest fires. From what I've seen, the local authorities know about them, but they can't do much about it. They only come out at night. I think they're getting stronger, though. They never came close to this area, but they must be getting more comfortable around people. What do they do? I don't know, and I don't want to know. All I know is that noise attracts them. They don't do much when you're asleep. So why are there still people around this area? Shouldn't we leave? And go where? This is the only area of the city where the cops don't care. They basically rounded us up and dropped us here. Besides, it wouldn't matter anyways. Her voice got lower with that last part. What do you mean? I asked. Rumor is, those things are everywhere. I met folks that encountered them from all over the country. Whatever's happening, it ain't just here. Do people try to fight them? I think old Jacob heard of a man who shot one several times, but it wouldn't go down. She almost whispered. Do you... I think that's enough talk for now. They can hear when you talk about them. I don't want any more talk about this. Not looking for trouble. Here, eat up. 
I opened a can of food. It ain't much, but it'll get your belly full for a day. She asked before, essentially interrogating me on my life story. That night, I tried to sleep, but once again, I found myself wondering about what those creatures could be. Right as I was about to close my eyes, I felt it. That static in the air and the smell of decay. The cries of dogs filled the air. Except this time, I heard a dog bark right outside of the tent. Rudolph, get back here, boy. I heard a man yell as quietly as he could. From the shadows, I could see the dog run up in front of our tent, barking at a shadowy figure. It was taller than the one last night, but it had the same long bony arms that reached down to its knees and ended in sharp, curled up talons. It used it to snatch up the dog and rip it in half, silencing the dog's barks with a loud, horrible whimper and splattering the plastic of our tent with a dark liquid. Rudolph! The man cried out, grabbing some sort of stick and hitting it with his might, but the figure merely grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against the wall of our tent, ripping through causing both of them to fall right over on top of me. I just sat there in complete shock, trying to register what was happening. All I heard was yelling from both Sandra and the man that was being held on by the creature. Its bald head was splattered with blood, its eyes were completely icy and dead, and it had a twisted smile that revealed shark-like teeth drenched in blood. It opened its mouth and a large black tongue covered in small black spikes slithered out, going down at the man's throat. The man's screams quickly turned into a sick, gurgling noise as the thing's tongue reached further and further into his throat. Blood splattered all over, and I felt some wet substance hit my face. I felt a pressure around my arm and I was lunged to my side. I tried to scream but felt a hand wrap against my mouth. It was Sandra. Only she was silently hushing me while pulling me aside from it. We ran out into the pitch black of the night, running through the labyrinth of tents full of silent yet terrified bystanders. Eventually, we reached a corner of the encampment, which contained a rusty, broken down car covered in blue plastic tarps. She motioned for me to crawl underneath it while trying to cover me with the tarp. Quickly, kid, we don't have all day. Just stay under there and be silent. No matter what you hear, do not come out. Not even if it's my voice. Just wait until the sun comes up. She whispered rapidly. I tried to get a glimpse between a crack of the tarp, but I could barely make out anything other than the outlines of Sandra. She seemed to grab a nearby pipe and held it against her in a defensive maneuver. Rudolph. A raspy, crackly, yet animalistic voice screamed out of the darkness. It sounded as if someone was playing a recording of that dead man's last words, and combined it with that of an animal just learning to speak. Rudolph. It found us. It pranced on all fours and walked towards our area. Its naked body was now drenched in red liquid, dripping from it like rain. Sandra tried to hit it with a pipe, but it merely grabbed it with its large claws and raised her up with the other one by the throat, digging into her throat slightly. She tried kicking and wriggling out, but it opened its mouth and stuck its spiny black tongue down into her throat as well. I closed my eyes and covered my mouth to avoid making a sound. After a while... I stopped hearing the sound of a stifled screaming and gurgling, but I was too scared to open my eyes. I heard its wet footsteps crawl over to me, but I was too scared to look. I merely closed my eyes and held my breath so it didn't hear me. Rudolph. It hissed in that disgusting, inhuman voice. I heard the metal of the car bend and creak as that thing crawled on top of it. I laid there on the cold concrete for what must have been hours, counting down the seconds before the sun rose. It must have been around dusk when I finally heard that thing make its way off the car and into the darkness that was being lit up by the dim orange cast in the distance. I peeked through the tarp to make sure it was leaving, and it slightly turned around and made direct eye contact with me. Its blood-coated face grinned slightly, barely revealing the sharp edges of its teeth but it merely walked away proudly like a predator after a satisfying hunt. 
I laid there until I felt the heat of the sun boil the concrete into a smoldering rock burning my skin, which forced me to get off it. I walked back into the direction of the tents, looking around to see the inhabitants crowding around the front entrance of the encampment. There was a large group of police officers and men in black suits pushing away everyone. Stay back. Nothing to see here. Go back into your tents. A barely old man yelled into a loudspeaker as he motioned his officers to step forward. Sandra's tent was being sealed off in yellow tape, and several detectives stood all around it. The cops stood outside, motioning bystanders to move out of the way while muttering under their breath. Dang, another one? Hey, you think those suits know something about what is doing this? I bet it's some Jack the Ripper copycat. Nah, I bet it's aliens. They snorted and chuckled to themselves before a barely one spotted me in the crowd. Hey, that one has blood on his face. Kid, stop right there. I felt like a deer in headlights and I stumbled backwards looking for a way out. I was not going to go to jail. I knew they were going to pin this on me. I heard shots behind me and a bystander fell near me. I didn't get a chance to see who it was before. I felt a pressure run into me causing the both of us to stumble on the floor. It was one of the cops putting pressure on my arm and another one putting handcuffs on me. They were trying to drag me away before one of the men in suits stepped up. He's under our custody now. Thanks, boys, but we'll take it from here. He remained expressionless during the entire ordeal. Screw you, we caught him. He's ours. You don't even have jurisdiction here. One of the men tried to shove me next to his side. I think that should be the least of your concerns. You should be more occupied learning to manage such situations. And you want us to trust you with such a vital witness. I could hear these screams and chaos unfold around us. The cop huffed and left, throwing around curses left and right, leaving me all alone with him. I looked up at him and noticed that he was completely bald. His skin was so clear and white that I could see every vein and ligament. It was almost translucent. I couldn't see his eyes though. They were obscured by the thick black frames of his sunglasses. We're going to take you down into our headquarters and we're going to talk. Is that okay? He asked, not caring about the blood splatter on my face. We left the scene in a black van, along with the other suits, and I tried to look out to see where we would be going, but the windows were so tinted that I couldn't see through them. Instead, I sat in silence with the suit who was too busy looking through his laptop. From the reflection of his glasses, I could see that he was analyzing other crime scenes. I tried to squint to get a better view without him noticing, but I guess he caught on because he turned his laptop for me to get a better view. Better? He asked, forming a slight, creepy smile. Sorry, I apologized while leaning a bit down into my seat. From the brief glimpse, I couldn't recognize the images on his laptop. The bodies were torn in half. They weren't anything like last night, though. It was revolting, and it left a chill down to my core. We arrived at this building sometime later. I can't tell you much about it, simply because they put a black sack over my head. But I could tell you that the walk was quite long, the sound was muffled, and the air was still almost like we were underground. When they took it off, I could see that I was in a completely empty room, just a chair and a table with him and I. Alright Matthew, I have you here as unemployed and your current home address is at my parents' house. Kind of a long way from home, don't you think? He smirked. I was kicked out for being gay. I don't know how I moved to the city, hoping to get a job. I replied honestly. Well, that's no good. I think we can form some sort of arrangement. I just need you to help me in return. What do you mean? I asked, leaning my hands forward. I just need you to tell me everything you saw last night in perfect detail. Everything you can remember. He leaned back in his chair and put his feet up on the table. I nodded and began to tell him everything I saw and heard, down to the events right before they had caught me. That's interesting. Sandra barely knew you and yet she still sacrificed her life for you. Tell me, do you miss her? I blinked in confusion. I just told him some weird stuff went down. And he's asking me about the dumbest stuff. Who was this guy? That's none of your concern. 
Listen, kid, we know about them. We just don't know why they're all coming out. It's like something is scaring them from the underground. Or maybe it's the recent fires, who knows. You're fine as long as you stay away from those areas. The dirty, grimy area is full of humanities, the lowest of the low. Those things are everywhere, but it's not even the least of our concerns. There's much more to fear as a human. I sat in silence, trying to digest everything this guy was telling me. I wanted to write him off as a lunatic, but I knew he was telling the truth. Why are you telling me this? I asked, curious as to why he would even tell me a bit of the truth. It seemed weird to tell some random kid off the street some secrets of the government. We don't work for the government. I don't know. Did you not want to know? I honestly don't care. Do with the information as you will. It's not like anyone will ever believe you. Our organization is scrubbing the evidence as we speak, and you will be closely monitored. I'm always curious as to the reactions of those who know. Who knows, maybe you'll even come to work with us. He replied joyfully while clasping at his hands like a child getting a birthday present. Things got a little hazy after that. I remember waking up in a hotel room with a new phone and a laptop along with instructions on how to access my new bank account. They gave me enough money to live carefree for a couple of years. I'm not sure why I'm writing this. I guess I just want to feel something other than the numb feeling that's crawled up to my soul ever since everything went down. What could he have meant that there were worse things to fear?